And will you go, welcome to our first Wednesdays. Thank you, brother, man. Well, uh, welcome to our first Wednesday. It's the very first Wednesday of the month. We only come out on Wednesday nights one time a, uh, a, a month. And we are grateful for our opportunity to, uh, to do our teaching and our studying together. I want you to grab 1 Samuel. I, got, I believe that there's something in the Word of God that we can all be challenged by. I want you to grab 1 Samuel, and when you get 1 Samuel, stand to your feet all over the building. It's the way that we, one of the ways, rather, that we honor the Lord when we read the Word of God. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, uh, and I want to talk to us uh, for a few minutes about God speaking. Somebody shout, God still speaks. You, do y'all really believe that? You believe that God still speaks? You still, you just, are you waiting on him to speak to the pastor um, in order for you to find out what he's saying to you? Um, I want to talk to us about God is still speaking. Let's, uh, if you've got 1 Samuel uh, chapter, go to chapter 3 and let's go to uh, the second verse. Uh, and this is what the scripture and the word of the Lord says. It says, and it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place. And when his eyes begun to grow dim that he could not see, so dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of, the, of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel. Uh-oh, I'm moving and y'all not moving. There we go. That the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, here I am. And so he ran to Eli and said, here I am for you, uh, uh, for you called me. And he said, I did not call. Lie down again. And he went and he lied down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And he answered, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, Yahweh, nor was the word of Yahweh yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again. The third time. So he arose and he went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be that if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant, help me say that last word, hears. Your servant hears. So Samuel went and he lied down in this place. I want you to find three people and say, when God speaks. When God speaks. When God speaks. All right. Those are the wrong three people. I know it's not a, it, just tell them, just find three more people and say, and when God speaks. One, we appreciate you all. You, you may be seated. Father, in Jesus' name, speak to us, minister to us, challenge us. But more importantly, God, give us faith and hope to know that you have not left us without a word for our lives and without a word for our direction. Father, you, you may not be here in body, but you are here in spirit. And you have left a word that can guide our direction, that is a light and a lamp to our path. And it's for this reason we give you praise. Now preach, teach through us, minister to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so it's it's good to have you all tonight. Um, we this is always this is our first Wednesday. Here's one of the cool things about first Wednesdays that I always encourage. I would that uh, that the entire body of Christ, uh, local body of Christ, would come here on Wednesday nights and really just immerse yourself in the worship. Because wasn't our worship amazing? When I were, so it's, this is our time for us to immerse ourselves in the worship. You don't have to overly concern yourself about, uh, you know, having to go through announcements and all the things that we do on Sundays. What, what our hope is, is that we can invite ourselves into the presence of the Lord and just allow the moment to be. That's where we're hoping that we get to. That's where we want to keep building this to. So you guys are a seed to Wednesday. Somebody shout, I'm a seed. You're a seed to us growing our Wednesday night fellowship. Wednesday, we do this once a month, once a month. And what I try to do every month is I try to release something that I believe that God is challenging me to challenge you with. I believe that God challenges me to challenge you. So what we do on First Wednesdays is we try to release that challenge and lay it on your desk 
off of my heart onto your desk, right? And, and then allow you to maneuver your life around the word of the Lord. That's what I believe that God wants to use these Wednesdays for. And, and I'm grateful that you guys have made this a part of your monthly worship is to be here because God has a word for us tonight as well. All right. And I want to talk to us about when God speaks. Uh, the reality of it is there's always a question about does God speak and is he still speaking? It's the 21st century and does God still speak the same way? And if he is speaking, then, um, then how do we know he's speaking and how do you hear him and how do, you, how do you respond to him? And if he's speaking, what frequency is he on? Because it's sometimes when we're doing life, it feels like God is speaking on FM and we are on AM. Yeah, you know what I mean? It, sometimes it just feels like that. It feels like God is, he seems like, like God is on a frequency that we're not on. And particularly when life gets a little bit haywire, when life gets challenging, we start to say that maybe God has stopped speaking. And I, I want to challenge the thought of the person that feels and believes that God does not speak in the 21st century. God is always speaking. Yeah, I believe it was Jesus that said to his disciples, he says, I have to go away from you now, but there are many things that I have not spoken to you. That is a powerful thing that God wants. Uh, that he said there are many things that I want to tell you that I have not spoken to you. That is a very powerful statement that Jesus would make. It's a statement where he says that I am not going to be here, but I still have a lot more to say. I'm not going to be here, but I'm not going to stop talking either. All right, and this is a powerful uh, illustration of what it is that God wants to do and what God has chosen to do. That while Jesus, who has risen from the dead, is not physically with us, he has not left us without the imprint of his word. And he has not left us with a progressive, relevant revelation of what he is expecting from us in our lives. So God is still speaking. Somebody shout, God is speaking. Say that loud. Shout, God is speaking. Now, that has to be embodied as a believer. It has to be not just believed, but embodied. You have to imbibe the idea that God has and wants to be in conversation with me. That God doesn't just talk to my pastor. He doesn't just talk through the priest. He doesn't just talk through the bishops. He doesn't just talk through the eldership. God wants to speak through me, to me. He wants to speak to you in this room. That, that is such a critical idea because we, we shortchange our relationship with God because we expect to hear God from somebody that has gone to school to learn how to hear the voice of the Lord. Instead of understanding that what God has always wanted was not to work through the priest, but he wanted to work through the persons. Did you hear what I just said? So now, this is the way this worked. In the Old Testament temple, there used to be three phases of this temple. There was an outer court, there was an inner court, and then they had this place called the, holy, the most holy place. Some of us call it the holies of holy. Now, in the holies of holy, there was the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant just simply represented the power and the presence of God himself. So in the most holy place, and we'll talk, about the, we'll talk about the tabernacle later this year, but in the most holy place of this tabernacle was a box that we call the Ark of the Covenant that represents the full presence and power of God. Now, the reason why this was at the furthest end is because God wanted us to understand the journey of traveling from where we are on the outer skirts as sinners all the way into his presence. So there was an outer court, there was an inner court, and then there was this huge curtain. There was this big, huge curtain that separated the outer, uh, the outer court, the inner court, and the holies of holies. It was a really interesting thing. A huge curtain separated the most holy place where the presence of God was with the outer court and the inner court. Now, why is this important? It's important because every time the children of Israel created a synagogue, it was, 
it was created off of the pattern of this Old Testament tabernacle. Do you remember the, what the tabernacle is about? The tabernacle is just a portable tent that had these three phases. And every time God wanted to tabernacle with his people, he'd say, open it up. I want to meet with you. Open it up. I want to talk to you. So whenever they would tent and God would tabernacle with them, they would have the, holy play, uh, the outer court, inner court, and the most holy place. The priest, the highest priest, was the only person that was able to go into the most holy place. He was the highest, the high priest. Now, this is all going to make sense to you in a few seconds. The high priest was the only one that could go into the most holy, or the holies of holy, this is the same place, the most holy place. The high priest was to be ceremoniously clean. The high priest was to have a life that honored God. The high priest would go into this holy place and he would minister unto God in the holy place on behalf of all of the people on the outside. When he brought the sacrifice into the most holy place, they said that God himself with fire would come out of heaven and consume the sacrifice. And the smell of that sacrifice, the scripture said, was a soothing savor to God in heaven. And God was pleased. Now, the high priest, somebody shout high priest. Somebody shout high priest. The high priest was the only one that could go into the holies of holy. Who was the only one that could go into the holy place? The high priest. You and I could not go. The eldership could not go. The only person that was there, we could go all the way into the inner court, but could never go into the most holy place. There was a huge curtain that separated the holy place from the other two places. And when they created the synagogue system, the synagogue system is just basically after the children of Israel stopped wandering and they started to operate in the place where God put them, they built what we now call churches, but for them they were called synagogues. Synagogues were built off, off, off the temple in the Old Testament. We, they call them synagogues now, but the temple in the, Old Test, in the New Testament, they were built off of this idea. Now, Jesus dies. Three days later, Jesus rises from the dead. The Bible says, somebody shout, the Bible says. Pastor Terrell didn't say this. The Bible says that when Jesus died for all of our sins, they went into the temple and they went from the, whole, the inner court to the, uh, from the outer court into the inner court and they went to the most holy place and they realized that the veil that separated the most holy place from the rest of it was torn in two. It says, the, the, new, the King James Bible says, and the veil was rent, R-E-N-T, all right? I'm going to say torn in two because rent to me is going to cost me something, right? So he says, it's torn in two. The, the, what was God trying to explain when he was showing us that the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, rather, that was in the most holy place, which represented the manifest presence of God, and the outer court and inner court, two places that any of us could go into, was now torn into. What God was trying to express to us is that no longer did a high priest need to go before God for the regular man. But that God had torn the, rent, the veil and he said, whosoever will, let them come unto God. So now, God doesn't need, you don't need the pastor to get to God, all right? We're here to provoke you and to challenge you and to force you into thinking and to provoke you into higher levels of consciousness as it relates to God, but you don't need us to get you to God because God has created a pathway just for, just for you. That's why he said, come boldly before the throne, all right? So now, well, you know, so, but, but I always need uh, my pastor to go before God for me, and I always need my priest to go before God, to go to God for me. If if that is your understanding of our job, then you are misunderstanding our job. The the high priest, somebody shout high priest. The high priest was not representative of a pastor. The high priest was not representative of of a spiritual man at all. The high priest was representative of Jesus Christ. So the book of Hebrews calls him the high priest. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So God is now priest, prophet. Are you following how this goes? These are all the things that Jesus becomes. 
So now the high priest was not the pastor. It was never meant for us to go to God on your behalf. Jesus was going to God on your behalf. So the New Testament says, well, what is he doing now? Hebrews says he is, he is an advocate for you as the high priest standing next to God. He is now, the priest's job is to go before God for the people. That's the priest's job. Jesus is making intercessions on our behalf in the way that the high priest would have done, and he is now our high priest for us, and the high priest never represented pastors. It always represented Christ. Now, so don't put the, touch your neighbor and say, don't put all that pressure on Pastor T. Don't put all that pressure on me. Don't put the pressure on me. Your, your job. So now he can say things to us like, come boldly before the throne of grace that you might obtain mercy. Isn't that, now, does that make sense? He said, come boldly. Now, you, whenever you're ready to see God and deal with God and talk to God and wrestle through your stuff with God, he says, you can come anytime you are ready. And watch this. You are not going to a building. You are not going to a religious system. You are not going to a denomination. When you go on your knees and you say, Father in heaven, I'm bringing my petition to you. You are talking to the big Sadata. You are talking to God himself. You are talking to the man upstairs. And there is no place that separates you from him anymore. The only thing that separates you from God now is you. And the church said, now, but so now, God has, he is ready to have relationship. Now, speaking of tabernacle, you guys understand what tabernacle means. The word tabernacle means to dwell together. So when God says that I want, a tab- I want you to build a tabernacle, what he was telling them was build a place where we can hang out together. Build a place where we can dwell together. And we'll talk about this later in the year. Don't y'all get me to start teaching about the tabernacle. We'll talk about this later in the year. He says build a place where we can all hang together. But the problem is I can't hang anywhere because I'm holy. He said that's why they had to build something for him and there had to be sacrifices all the way up to the holy place, most holy place, because he says I'm too holy to meet you in the nightclub. I'm too holy to meet you in the sin you don't want to come out of. I'm too holy to meet you in your sloth. I'm too holy. So build a place where we can tabernacle, but build a place where I can come play too. Amen? So he told them what to build because they didn't know, they weren't holy enough to build him something. He told them how to build it. And because the place didn't satisfy, he told them to kill something that would represent all the sin that would ever happen. And then he said, and I'll come down. And they were tabernacle with God. And this is what God is saying. We get to do with him today. He's saying my desire is still to have fellowship with mankind. My desire is still not to just have fellowship with mankind that God, he want to have fellowship with you. You are mankind. You are womankind. He says, I want to have the kind of conversation where you don't have to go through religion to get to me. You don't have to warm up to get to me. You know how y'all warm up for church. You got to have to worship for 15 minutes before you go. He said, you don't have to warm up. I'm not, there's no opening act before you get to me. He says, all you've got to do is just say, Father, this is your son, Terrell. You know my spirit. You know my heart. You know my voice. You know what I look like. You created me. You formed me. You know my voice. God, you even know if I'm not as sincere as I think I am in this prayer right now, but God, I'm here. That's powerful. That is powerful. I think we forget sometimes that we're in the presence of God. When we go into prayer, we're in the presence of God, period. We're in the presence of God, period. I had an opportunity to listen to Charles Stanley speak, and he challenged me about seven years or so ago. Not personally, but I was listening to him preach, and he was talking about the fact that he was getting up in age. And he was saying that I'm, I'm up in age, but he said, but every day my body will allow me to, I try to go down to my knees to just honor the fact that I'm in the presence of God. He said, try, he said I try to every day in my life. He said, I can't do it like I used to. And I took that as a personal challenge. When I sense the presence of the Lord, I, don't, I, just, I just go to my knees. It's just like, God, I'm in my office right now, but I'm about to get, I'm not going to give it to you in the chair. You deserve my, 
Because we're in the presence of God, duh. Right? How about that, right? We're in the presence of God. And sometimes it's in the midnight hour, and sometimes it's early in the morning, and sometimes it's in the ride to church, and sometimes it's in the ride to work, and sometimes it's at work where you just kind of, you ever been at work and just had to kind of slide out for a second and just say, God, ah, and then, okay, I got you. Go ahead, give me them papers. Let me finish what I got to do. You know, because, because there should always be an open line of communication between man and God. Open line of what? Of what? The only way we can communicate is somebody has to be speaking in some form or fashion. So if God says that I want to have communication with you, he is saying that I want to speak to you. Now, the question is, how does God speak? If God speaks, how does he speak? Because there, because. We are having dialogue right now, and we oftentimes think that this is the only way we speak. So speaking is not just about words, it's about communication. So the question is, how does God communicate today? Does God still communicate with me? And at what level does he communicate with us? And if he communicates with us at any level, is it at this inferior level that has only to do with the universe and the world and the greater things? Or does he really care about how my day went? Can he care about the universe and my day at the same time? Does he care about the, the world and my day at the same time? And to say that God is uninterested in your day is to put a limit on God that says he can only handle big things and he can't, you know, proverbially walk and chew gum at the same time. When in your own life, you have to deal with bills and work and all that stuff, but at the same time, you sit and ask your children, how was your day? And, why, and I'm still concerned about all of these things while at the same time being present at this thing. And that's how wonderful God is. God can be present with you right now while he's taking care of things bigger than you'll ever even know exist. Amen? Amen? Tell, tell, tell somebody, God cares about me. God cares about Tell them God cares about you. God cares about you. So what is it like when God speaks? Now, what happens now is Samuel, Samuel is one of the prophets. He's one of the early, earlier prophets, and we know his story. He became a super powerful prophetic voice for God. But he's a young man in this particular text. And he is studying under Eli, who was an early, earlier prophet. And the Bible says that at this point, Samuel doesn't even know who Yahweh or God is. He doesn't even know who God is at this point. And we're not sure if that meant in relationship or if perhaps he came from the kind of background where they believed in other religions and other gods. We're not sure what that means yet. But what we, are, what we do know is that the scripture says that at this point, he doesn't really have a relationship with God. And, but God wants to have a relationship with him. He doesn't have a relationship with God, but God wants to have a relationship with him. That's, that's really something you should always be grateful is that you never really technically found God. God found you. Isn't that pretty amazing? You know how we talk about when God, when I found the Lord, I found the Lord. I was in my knees. I was sinking in sin, and I found the Lord. I found a Savior. You didn't find God. God found you. He didn't even know to look for God. And God says, I'm going to use Samuel. So what happens is Samuel goes to sleep, and God says, uh, Samuel, and Samuel wakes up. He runs into Eli, his mentor's room. He says, did you call me? He says, no, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. Maybe I dreamt it. He goes back to sleep. The Lord says, Samuel. Samuel jumps up. He runs into Eli's room a second time. He says, you call me? He says, no, boy, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. He goes back to sleep, and he, he falls, he goes and lays down, and he goes back to sleep. And the Bible said that Samuel called him a third time. He said, I mean, that the Lord called him a third time. He says, Samuel, Samuel wakes up. He goes in to Eli. He says to Eli, he says, hey, I know you called me. And the Bible says that, that Eli discerned that maybe the Lord was trying to minister to him. And he tells him, he says, go back and lay down. And the next time you hear somebody call, he, uh, the next time you hear him call your name, he knew who he was. He said, the next time you hear him call your name, you say, Lord, here I am. He, had, he was clear what was happening. He was discerning of what was happening. And sometimes that's what it takes, is it takes that kind of mentorship to help people understand how God speaks. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? Is that we don't, there is no magic trick. Like we, people come into church and they come into moves like ours and they sense the spirit and they touch by the anointing and uh, God does all these things and we say things like, man, I feel like God is saying, or I sense the Holy Spirit is saying, and we tell people, hey man, now go follow the leading of the Lord. And they're like, what does that mean? Like, what do you mean? Listen to the Lord when he speaks or God is telling me. Like, what do you mean God is telling me? And sometimes we need that kind of Eli mentorship to help people say, God is speaking. To help people understand, this is the way God will minister to you. And the only way that we understand the way that God ministers to, is to, one, believe that he still speaks. Now, I want to give you five ways that God is still speaking. Some of this is going to be reviewed for some of y'all that are deep. But for some of us that need the word of God uh, in our lives, we're going to, we, uh, we understand that there are a handful of ways that God speaks, watch this, that are biblically authorized. Five ways that God speaks that are biblically, somebody shout biblically. Biblically authorized, and I'm going to give you one that's not biblically authorized. Here's the first, thing, the first way that God speaks to us today. By his word, the word of God, the Bible. This is the primary way that God speaks. Somebody shout my Bible. Your Bible is the primary way that God speaks. The scripture said that it has everything in it that's pertaining to life and godliness. That's a powerful statement to say. To say that this Bible has everything pertaining to life and godliness. Now, watch this because I want you to understand this part of the scripture. When the Bible says that, that it's everything pertaining to life, he's not talking about everything that lives. Because we do understand that there were things that were a part of this world that were here before we got here. That just messed y'all up real good. All right, there were the, the, the Bible talks about the, the, uh, the Nephilim and the anim, anim, uh, uh, Anakim, and those were giants that were in the land. We know they were here. The fossil fuels show, we know dinosaurs were here. People are not making that up. We know that. The fossil fuels show that they're not here right now, but we know they were here. But God, so God is talking about, he, what he is talking about is he is talking about the life the span of existence in which the human being is now at the center of his, of his command. So now, the, the life that God is speaking about is our life, the life of the human being. So God, the Bible has given us everything we need to have a full life if you're one of these species. So the Bible has everything and pertaining to godliness. So when he talks about life, he's saying he, he knows how to, he knows he's going to give you wisdom about your marriage. He's going to give you wisdom about your money. He'll give you wisdom about your temper. He's going to give you wisdom about your attitude. He's going to give you wisdom about your slothfulness. He's going to give you wisdom about all, everything pertaining to this life and godliness. Somebody shout godliness. Not only this life, because you can have a great life, but miss God. He says, but, I, but it's about life and about how to please God. He says, I, the, the Bible is the, is the key for that. Watch what the Hebrew writer said. The Hebrew writer says in 4 and 12, he said that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner. Somebody shout discerner is a discerner of our thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, uh, the three words I want you to make sure that you write down if you're note-taking right now. He says that the word of God is quick. Somebody shout quick. That word means alive. To quicken means to come alive. That word quick means to alive. He says that the word of God is alive. It is not just paper, uh, words on a paper, but it in fact will find you in every space you are in your life. It, it can mean, watch this, it can mean different things at different parts of your life. That is the power of the word of God. You can read one scripture in one season of your life and it mean one thing and make you shout and dance. And then another season of your life, it can mean a whole nother thing in your life and make you dance and shout. And then a whole nother season. And it's the same scripture, but because it's alive, y'all are not talking back to me. It knows how to move when you move. All right. It knows how to move when you move. And that's the power of the word of God. The Bible said that the word of God is alive. It can fill you. It can sense you. It can find you. And not only is it alive, the Bible says it's powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Somebody shout a two-edged sword. 
Now, when we think about a two-edged sword, we've oftentimes been taught that it's the, the sword that the army people use, and it has a blade on both sides of it, and you can yield it left and to the right, and there's a blade on both sides, and that's what he means when he says that. And that would be traditional Bible teaching. But what we do understand is that the word that is used to describe the two-edged sword is actually not a sword at all. It was more like a fisherman's dagger. It's the same word that was, that was used when it talks about Peter cutting a man's ear off. When Peter cut the man's ear off, he had a fisherman's dagger. So while it was not as big and heavy and robust as a, as a military person's sword, it was much finer and sharper because it had to scale fish. It had to get from that, from that, that layer that layer so you don't dig too much into the meat of the fish, so you had to get through the layer of skin. Do y'all? I, now, I didn't eat some of y'all fish, so I know y'all know what I'm talking about. It's, it's, not, it's the scale off, but it's that first layer of skin, that real thin layer, and it's able to go. That's what he's saying how sharp that knife is, is it's able to scale the fish and cut that first layer off and, and not dig in too deep as to, watch this, make you walk away from God. But it'll peel that layer off so you can see who you are. Jesus, help me in this place. That's what he says about the word of God. He said the word of God, will, will, the word of God was never meant to hurt you. It was always meant to just reveal you to you. And he says that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And he says, and he pierces even unto the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. Now, uh, uh, intellectually speaking, there are some people that feel like there is not a difference between the soul and the spirit. And when you define it, it's a hard word to define. Soul and spirit are, devil, are difficult words to define scripturally. The Greek struggled with it. The Hebrew struggled with it. The American language struggles with it. The Latin struggles with it. What we know is that in times of the Bible, they use them as, as a separate entity. And at other times, it feels like it's one entity. And what Paul is saying, or what the, the Hebrew writer is saying, let's not give it to Paul if he didn't say he wrote it, but he wrote it. So... <laughs> <laughs> he still wrote it. I don't care if he don't say it. It, it sounds like Paul. It, it writes like Paul. It's poetic like Paul. If it walk like a duck, <laughs> quack like a duck, it's Paul. So, but whoever the Hebrew writer was, was saying this about it, it, it divide. He's saying that the soul and the spirit are so intertwined and connected that most people don't think that there's a difference. But the word of God is so sharp, he can find the difference between you. Are you following what I'm saying? Y'all missing what it is. Cause, see, there are gray areas that we live in. And those gray areas are really thin. And those, you know how y'all got those gray areas where you think that God might be okay with this and he might not be okay with this. But he'd be okay with it if he knew my heart and all that. And God said, if you get in the word of God, he says, you won't have to be questioning because I'll just cut and you'll know this is right and what you're about to do is wrong. Amen. That's the power of the word of God. That's the power of the word of God. There would not be so much ambig ambiguity of trying to figure out whether I should do this or if I'm right or is this okay, is this not okay, and this should be okay for the 21st century, even though it wasn't okay in the 19th century. There's, there would be very little of that if we spent more time in the word because the word just cuts it, opens it up, say this is truth, that's a lie. Humanity can survive with this, can't survive with that. Communities can win with this, they can't win with that. Amen. What's this? He said, dividing of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. Now, if you know anything about the bones, you understand that it's very difficult to find the difference between where the joints and the marrow, the sinews and all that kind of stuff are. He says that that's another sign of how sharp the knife is. But he also says that, watch this, it's a discerner. Somebody shout discerner. It's a discerner of thoughts and the intents of the heart. Not only does the word of God discern means to know the truth about. The, the, uh, does, to discern means what discernment is, is a revelation of the flat out truth. No if, no, it's, it's truth. And when you discern something, you just know even if you don't know. When you discern, you just know. I just, I got, I discern, I, I just feel like I should leave. And then you find out that danger was in the room. 
because something in your spirit knew the truth even though your head didn't. So discernment is an act of the spirit. Now watch what the Bible says about the word. He says that it is a discerner of thoughts. It, it knows the truth about your thoughts even if you lie to yourself. I'm going to give myself a hand on that one because that's, that's good preaching whether y'all say amen or not. He knows the truth about your thoughts and not just the truth about your thoughts, but the real intentions of your heart. Not the stuff you tell us. He knows the real intentions, not the lie that you choose to tell yourself. The only reason I'm doing this is because this is going to make the family better. The, the Bible, if you're in the word of God, you'll be reading scripture and you realize, ah, I'm not doing this for the family. Oh, God. And, once, and when you're in the word of God, watch who, get, watch who you got to face. When, you, when you're in the word of God, you don't have to face God. You get to face you. That's what the word of God is about. The word of God is about helping you see you in light of God. And when we see ourselves and see that, I'm, that, I'm, that, I'm, that my thoughts are not as pure as I claim them to be and my intentions have not all been righteous in the actions that I've done and I've said things that had the wrong intention and I've, and I've released things that came from false thoughts and I blame people for things that I never got understanding about and I went through my whole life being hurt by life, blaming it on somebody else. The word of God will say, hold your brakes. And it will show you the truth about yourself in light of the fact of who God is. So the word of God will make you say, boy, I'm not who I thought I was. And, it, and it's supposed to make you say, well, I, in order to meet the mark that I believe I should be, I'm clearly short of it. Maybe I need to look to the hill. Because if I'm going to make it, it's clear the word of God helped me understand that I'm not who I thought I was. Because he discerned my real heart and my real thoughts. And most of us struggle with the truth about ourselves. Amen. And it makes you look at the Lord. So the primary way, somebody shout the primary way that God speaks to us today is by the word of God. The second way that God speaks to us, uh, the, word of God. the second way God speaks to us is through visions and dreams. Through visions and dreams. Uh, this is important that we understand that when, when God, God will get his message, he's speaking. Visions and dreams, speaking. He's speaking. While this may not be an audible thing, it is still a communication by God. Um, a vision is an inspired appearance in your mind and in your spirit. It's an inspired appearance in your mind and in your spirit that illuminates into your brain. And you say, wow, I see something. I see what God is, I see, and it could be a message, it could be a situation, it could be, it could be metaphoric, it could be literal. And a dream, watch this, a dream is the exact same thing except when you're asleep. Dream is the exact same thing except God catches you when you can't resist him. You following what I just said? All right? So the idea, so in Acts chapter 2 and 17, watch what God said. The question is, are we still, is God still speaking? But look at what he says in Acts 2. He says, and it will come to pass that in that last day that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see what? Will see what? And they will dream, and your old men shall dream what? Your old men will dream dreams. He says that I will be redemptively revealing myself to us by, by imagery, imagery. And you, can't, and you cannot let a moment when God ministers to you in dream or by vision make you afraid of what God is doing. You can't be afraid when you wake up and you say, boy, man, there was something that I dreamt that, that put a, a real impression on my spirit. It burned an impression into my spirit. I can't let it go. I believe God is trying to say something to me. All right? You can't just let those things slide. You can't, you can't let them slide. You can't let it slide when you, if you have a moment and you look up, it's like, boy, that was kind of weird. Paul said one time, I was between here and there. I didn't know where I was in the third heaven. I'm not. He said, but I know that I saw something. I saw something. Peter uh, had the vision of the, of the sheet being folded with the food on it. 
All of these are proper ways for God to minister to you. And some of you perhaps have had moments where God has been trying to speak to you and you just kind of pawned it off on, I ate too late last night. You know, you just try to pawn it off like, this is weird. They, she keeps showing up in my dreams. I don't know why my homegirl keeps showing up in my dreams. Because God is trying to tell you that she, that she needs your prayers. God is trying to say, pick up the phone and call and check on her. Make sense? That's the way God speaks. And he'll speak warnings in dreams, and he'll speak truth in dreams, and he'll speak, he'll speak graces in dreams. He'll speak, and, 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 and he, will, he will, if he does not give you the interpretation of dreams, sometimes they're just little, you know what they mean. Other times they're metaphoric, and you know what they mean. And other times they're metaphoric, and God sends you to the third way he speaks to understand. He sends you to people. The other way is that God speaks through people and prophetic utterance. He'll send you to somebody and, he'll, and you can say, hey, man, I had this dream. What do you think the Lord is saying? And the Lord, the, God will speak through people to say, hey, this is what that means. And this is what, you ever had that happen in your life? You don't have to go to a dream book. Find somebody anointed. Amen. Boy, y'all quiet now. You don't have to ask the dream book, what, the, what does it mean? What does it mean when I have when it's water all the time? In my dream, it means get saved and get baptized. Now, I don't know what that means. But I'm just saying, you understand where I'm going with that. So, <laughs> no, you know, for the old saints, everything meant go get to the cross. Everything meant get to the cross. I saw fire. What was fire about? You're going to hell if you don't get your life together. Go on to hell if you don't get your life together. I saw trees. I saw trees. How many trees did you see? Two. That meant take one, put them in the grass. That's the cross. God said, get to the cross. We just. <laughs> I grew up like that. Boy, they made everything about Jesus, boy. They made everything about Jesus. Boy, I had this dream about chairs and just chairs. And, and God said, I'm going to sit on you and let the Holy Ghost just rest on me. He said, I'll be your strength. I'm your legs. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's you know. But, but, but people, somebody shout people. People are one of the most primary resources that God uses to speak to us. And this is critical and it's important. Now, uh, watch, what, watch what Peter says in uh, 1 Peter 4 and 11. He says, uh, he says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as an oracle. Somebody shout oracle. An oracle is a spokesperson is a mouthpiece for God. If God gets ready to use you or if God is using you to share something with someone or to share it with the greater body of people, uh, a message, a warning, a challenge, an encouragement, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, realize that you are not being used as a vessel and an instrument that Peter says is an oracle of God, a spokesperson now. I represent the product, who is God in heaven. So when I speak, I don't get to represent something else. I can only represent him. If I was the spokesperson for Tide washing powder, I don't get to bring another powder onto the screen talking about Tide. I don't get to show up with a Dawn I don't know, a T-shirt on talking about Todd. I have to represent who I'm the spokesperson for. I have to read the script the spokesperson gave me. So when a prophetic utterance goes forward, you have to say the script that God is putting in your heart and in your spirit. Because there's somebody on the other side of that conversation that's waiting, watch this, to hear God speak. Waiting for God to speak to them. And this is the way. And, and unfortunately, because, because we do not train in understanding discernment much, many of us are manipulated with this part of it. Because it's somebody we like comes and ministers to us or somebody is over spiritual or think they're more spiritual than you and you's like, oh, well, she must because she's more spiritual than me. Her, this has to be right. You know, and instead of having your discernment on, we just accept what this, listen, God speaking is serious business. While God probably speaks more than you give God credit for because of the ways that he speaks, he's probably talking to you more than you give him credit for. But he's, he's also not exclusively using one or two people. 
He's not exclusively like your, your, your prayer warrior friend is not the only one that can tell you what the word of the Lord is. Is that making sense? You hear what I'm saying? And you've got to be careful with people that will make you feel like, hey, I'm the voice of the Lord for your life. I'm the only voice of the Lord for your life. You need to come to me and talk. I'll pray with you. And I'll you got to watch that kind of stuff. That is cultic behavior. Y'all are not talking back to me. That is cultic behavior. So now, but people become important to God. God sends the prophet. He sent Moses to talk to, uh, to, talk to Ramses. He sent Elijah and Elisha at, to go talk to the people. He sent Jonah to go talk to the people. He sent John the Baptist to go talk to the people. He sent Peter. He sent Paul. He sent his son. And he sent some of us. Now, that doesn't mean that you're a prophet because you do something prophetic. Prophet is something totally different. Prophetic is a gift of being able to be used by God to share messages for God that a person may not readily be able to see, discern, or experience yet. That's what the prophetic gift is. The prophet is a gift to the body of Christ that God gave that is a positional position. One is an internal spiritual gift. The other one is a position for the church to be governed by. Make sense? All right? So now the prophetic or, or people, God will use people all the time. God uses people all the time. Now listen to me because now this is important that you, that you understand. The kind of people God uses. Because he'll use saved people. He'll use unsaved people. Because gifts come without repentance. I know y'all don't want to hear that crazy uncle tell you what the Lord said. But sometimes God be using him with his crazy self. Y'all know my story. I was led to Christ. I was led to go back to Christ by a drug addict that God just used him and was like, bro, you might want to think about going back to Jesus. I was like, you might want to think about getting off them drugs. That's <laughs> exactly what I told him right to his face. I said, you might. <laughs> he went home and went to sleep. I didn't sleep for almost three weeks till I gave my life to Jesus. You hear, you hear how that works? All right, because God will use, now let me tell you, God will use saved people, he'll use unsaved people, he'll use people you love, he'll use people you don't like. Watch it, but let me tell you who he doesn't use. He doesn't use dead people. He doesn't use, now I know y'all laughing, he don't use soothsayers, he don't use psychics. Y'all are not talking back to me in here. I'm trying to help you understand the word of the Lord. I'm trying to help you understand the word. Now, pastor, what do you mean he don't use them? Because they're right sometimes, and they are right sometimes. But it is illegal entry into the spirit. I'm going to preach about the occultic one time. There's illegal entry into the spirit. So Samuel is trying to, or excuse me, uh, Saul is, is trying to get the inside scoop on his kingdom. And Saul goes and finds a medium. He finds, he goes downtown and says, hey, read the card to me. Tell me what my, what my future looks like. And he gets in there and he sees one of the prophets who's been dead. And the prophet said, what are you doing in this spirit realm? How did you get here? And he told him, he said, because you're here, essentially, he says, because you're here illegally, you're going to lose your kingdom tonight. He comes out of the spirit and the medium gets up and takes off running and says, why didn't you tell me you were a man of God? He says, I wouldn't have took you back there if I would have knew. Y'all know. He said, I wouldn't have took you back there in that, in that next dimension if I would have known that you were a man of God. And he takes off running. Saul dies later in, the, in battle because of the word of the Lord. But this is, our, this is God trying to help us understand that I will speak to you and I do want to speak to you. But entry into the spirit dimension, no man comes to the Father except by not the medium guy. Are you hearing how that works? Are you hearing how that works? And there are good people that are waiting, trying to get something from the divine world into their life. There are people that are hurting, people that are in genuine quest for answers over their life, and they're trying to get an answer from a higher space or a space that is not in the terrestrial world, and we are running to these places because we are too kooky at church to be able to sit down and have a basic conversation with somebody and say the spirit of the Lord is saying, we got a high yah, shah, yah, yah, yah. Oh, Turn around three times. I feel him, I feel him, I feel him, I feel him. We got to do all the, the 
the extra stuff. Y'all not talking back to me in here. We do all this extra stuff to try to, to just simply say, God said, go back home. <laughs> That's what the Holy, the Holy Ghost said, go back home. She's still your wife. Go home. You know, it, but people are broken and they're hurting and they are looking for what we have, the access into the next dimension for what we have. Those that worship me must worship me where? In the spirit. And in the truth, that's how he says this is the way you get to me. If you want access to the dimension, he says, come by the way of worship. And I'll give you access to the things that you know, the things you don't know. I'll give you prophetic utterance. I'll give you utterances about your future. I'll tell you things that happened in your past, why they happened. I'll give you all of that in the dimension of the spirit. He says, but you got to come by me in order to get there. If you go another route to get here. You're walking away with stolen goods. You're walking away with stolen goods. You ever had a friend that worked at, a, at like a fast food restaurant or something? And, and, and because they had access, you went and got stuff that you didn't pay for and you walked out. Now you do realize they will arrest both of you if you get caught. Not just him. That both of y'all going to jail if you get caught. He's going to jail for giving you stuff, and you're going to jail, watch this, for receiving stolen goods. So God says that anything that can get into the dimension where I am without my consent, he calls it occultic. That's all the occult means. He said it's called, it's, it's the occult. To God, he calls it occultic. He says these are, these are thieves that come into my dimension and they pull out all my secrets, and they come out, and they give them to people on earth, and, they, and, and they, they navigate themselves on earth, and instead of worshiping me, they're worshiping the guy down on Main Street. It makes sense? And some of these people are really nice people that do this stuff, and they're gifted. Because th that, that would be the lie you would tell yourself is that they're not gifted, because many of them are gifted. They're just illegal entry, okay? So here's the final way I want to talk to you. Uh, I want to show you about the way that God, well, let's go with the audible voice real quick. Sometimes God does speak with an audible voice. John 10, 27 says that my sheep will know my voice. Sometimes God does whisper in your ear. Sometimes you will hear an audible voice. But let me tell you what I have learned. One of the most common ways God speaks to us in an audible voice is actually in our heart. I sense in my heart this is what God is saying. I'm feeling like God spoke to me. It doesn't necessarily mean it was like, hey, Terrell. It was God spoke to me. Hey, Terrell. In here, I knew God. And it was clear. And it was the way I would speak. And it's the way that I would listen. And I know that God was ministering to me. And it, this, so be mindful when you talk about, well, what does the still small voice sound like? It, it, in the Old Testament, it was a still small voice that came out of the sky. Today, it may, be, it may come out of the sky. But at the same time, there are times where God is speaking very succinctly to you in a way that you get it. He's speaking your language. He's speaking your slang. He's speaking your tone. He's speaking your tempo. He is dialoguing with you. And it's an internal thing that sounds like it's an external thing. And it's God saying, I'm, I'm here. He's like, I'm talking. I'm speaking. And it's important. And, God, and Jesus said that, that, that the people that, that are with me, they'll know me when I'm doing it. Okay? So don't be afraid of sensing that God is saying something, God is speaking. And again, if you are, are a novice with hearing the voice of the Lord, find a spiritual mentor that can help you understand that God will never say something to you that is outside of the parameters of his word. He, we, when we say that God will never say something that's in the word of God, we're not saying that God is going to speak scriptures to you. That's not what we're saying. But we're saying that God will, in context... And in, in, in inference, and he will, he, in conceptually speaking, he will talk to you and it won't, you know. So the Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And that's what the scripture says. God may not come to you and say, hey, hey man, go love your wife the way I love the church. But God may, may say, hey, be sacrificial in the way that you love God, your, your wife. Go home. And you're like, oh, God spoke to me. 
Now, he spoke in context with the way the scripture, though it wasn't the actual scripture. So God, that's why it's important to study the word of God. Because when God speaks, he will never speak outside of the concept and the context of this word. Because this word is what? Everything that is pertaining to life and godliness. You want to know how to be saved? Open this thing up and he'll help you out. And here's the final, the final way I want you to write this down. Is, is that number six? Number five. I got six because I actually was going to give you all ten of them. But I just wanted to get you number six. So here's number five. Life events. Life events. It, it's a, it, it, God speaks. I, I think it was Einstein. Let me see who, this quote that I wrote down. Um, uh, yeah, Einstein said, a coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. Life events, when stuff happens in your life, it could be by coincidence, it could be by happenstance. There are ways God will get your attention. And when God wants to speak to you, stuff will happen in your life, and you just look up and be like, okay, God, I hear you. Has that ever happened to anybody in here? Yeah, like you heard them loud and clear after the accident? You heard them loud and clear after you got caught? You heard them loud and clear? Well, you know, after, you know, you just, that's, it's just funny the way that God works. Like life happens, and then you'd be like, you know what? I did hear you say. God is trying to challenge me. God is trying to, God is trying to get my attention. God is trying to draw me back nearer to him. God is trying to move me into worship. God is trying to get me to repent. God is trying to get me to forgive. God is trying to get me to see. God is trying to get me because life has a way of doing those things, right? Life has a way. So God uses, and I can't even give you enough scriptures of the way that life happens and people come and find God. There was a man uh, when Jesus was uh, wanting to heal this woman with the issue of blood, he comes to her before he gets to her, and he says, hey, my daughter's dying. I need your help. That's what happened. Him and his whole house came to Jesus because life happened. Make sense? Make sense? Make sense? This guy, this Ethiopian eunuch is sitting on the side of the road, and he's trying to get his, his cart together and get fixed. He runs across the, the, the disciples. They get to talking to him. He starts listening and he says, shoot, boy, maybe this little accident wasn't random after all. Maybe it was a co coincidence. Can, can y'all baptize me too? Make sense? You see how God works? And sometimes life happens. And this is the way that God ministers to us. And this is the way that God speaks to us. And God is intentional about making life happen. And, and you got to be careful blaming everybody for the stuff that happens in your life because sometimes it's not the devil. Sometimes it's God saying, you're getting off track, son. You're getting off track, daughter. You're getting too big for your britches, daughter. Come on now. Wait a minute, I haven't heard from you in months. What's going on? What's going on? And you're like, but I'm in just a season of depression and I'm in a season of brokenness and I'm in a season of... And it, no, God is saying, hey, hey, come, come back to me. And that's one of the ways that God speaks. That's how God speaks. And those are the five ways that I want you to get. And I, and I want you to understand. There's one more way that I wish that I had time to give it to you. And it's called the unction. And the unction is just a strong urge, a sense, or feeling that God is challenging me to do something. Come on, stand to your feet. A strong unction that God is trying to push me or challenge me to do something. This is, these, this, you should never, in this room, you should never doubt whether God wants to speak to you. Not only should you never doubt that God wants to speak to you, you should be actively asking God questions. When life happens, when you start to sense things, when you dream things. Now, I don't want you getting kooky and thinking every dream is God and everything that happens in your life, God's trying to get my... It, you got to be able to discern this stuff. But at the same time, while these things are happening, you don't get to tell God, God, you're not speaking to me. You don't get to bemoan before God. God, just give me a word. You're not giving me a word. I need a word. I need a word. The way our language, the way our language should shift is our language should say, God, speak to me so I can hear you. Holy Spirit, minister to me in a way that I understand. Because I'm in a pickle right now and it feels like you're not talking. I can't discern what you're saying. So Holy Spirit, I'm gonna I'm wait on you. And watch this. I'm a, and here's one of the one of the enemies to communication is noise. One of the enemies to communication is too much noise. 
too much angst around you and too much stuff happening around. One of the enemies to, to hearing very clearly, you know, and sometimes there's so much noise, you got to peer in like, what? What? Huh? And sometimes we got to do that with God. When life is happening and things, you got to say, God, what? I can't. I'm, I know you're talking. Holy Spirit. And I might have to go on a fast to focus in on what he's trying to say. And I might have to get away from folks to focus in on what he says. And I might have to go back to my scriptures and say, boy, this is a much easier way than all this other stuff to try to hear what the Lord is saying. But don't ever doubt that God is not speaking. He's got a word for your situation. He's got a word for your trouble. He's got a word for your, your, your issue. He's got a word for your victory. Lift your hands all over this building. We're going to pray, take our offering, and head home. So, Father, I bless you now in the name of Jesus. I thank you that you are a speaking God. I bless you that you are a God that is unafraid to tell us what you think and to speak your mind concerning our journey. So, Holy Spirit, my prayer is that for some of us that need you to be our lamp and to be our light, for, the, for some of us that need you to be our guidance and be our strategic navigator, Father, help us hear you speak. Holy Spirit, help us hear you minister. Holy Spirit, help us hear you give us instruction. Instructions to let it go. Instructions to forge forward. Instructions to forgive. Instruction to relax and enjoy your victory. Instructions to smile. It's going to be over in the morning. So God, I thank you. And I pray that, that you would give, the, give us the spiritual ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. For this is the time where the people of God need to hear what you're saying. And God, I give you praise for it. I give you a thank you. And I give you your honor. And it's in Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. If that blessed you tonight, will you give God a great big hand praise? If that blessed you tonight, give God a hand praise. That's an awfully weak hand clap. I need you to give God a hand praise. If that blessed you tonight, I need you to give God a praise. Amen. I feel led to pray. Holy Spirit, I just honor you right now. I thank you. Holy Spirit, the, your glory. Your glory is in this house. Your glory is in this church. Holy Spirit, I thank you. I bless you. I honor you. Father, right, right now while your presence is here, Father, we just give you the praise and we give you the honor. And I, and I almost taught about the prophetic tonight. But so, God, I speak a word, a prophetic word over all of the prophetic voices that are in this room and that are at the sound of my voice, whether you're watching online or you're in this room. For all of those that never saw themselves as being used prophetic, that, God, you would give dreams to and they need to speak them over their children that you would give visions to and they need to tell that vision to their, to their husbands and their loved ones. The ones that you were speaking to their heart and to their spirit, God, and they need to send that text now that says what the spirit of the Lord is saying. The, the gift of pro, the prophetic is over this house. So I'm not the only prophetic person. The Bible says like priests, like people, I carry an anointing that is pervert, per, uh, that, is, that is permeating through this building. It is permeating through the men and women under the sound of my voice. So I speak to those that are in the prophetic space now that you fine-tune your ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying in the name of Jesus. Because what you speak is going to change lives. What you, when you speak, people will listen. When you reveal the secrets of God, God says that I reveal nothing to man except by my, by, by my servants, my prophets. So, God, as I pray now for those men and women that have a gift and that have been denying the gift, haven't been walking in it, or been moving in fear for this gift. Holy Spirit, I speak over their lives now to walk in the Spirit. Release yourself and trust the Word of the Lord. And when you speak, He'll begin to give you the words. When you open your mouth and, ch and challenge yourself to say yes, He'll give you the words to share. He'll give you the words to speak. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I bless you for it now, God. I thank you for it, Holy Spirit. I give you the praise for it. 